I'd like to start today's show with a poem written by today's guest, Mr. Joel Nelson. I first memorized this poem to recite for my wife Alyssa's birthday, and it's one of her favorite pieces, and it's one of my favorites too. I always think of Alyssa when I recite this, and I'll always be grateful to Joel Nelson for writing it. This poem is entitled, On Finding Someone. If on some better than average day, I should be riding along, observing, not expecting, well, maybe, and should see just as hoof swept by one flawless arrow point. If on that shining morning I should step down to lift this point, turning it delicately, feeling its smoothness beneath my fingertips, I would marvel at its perfection, at the way some ancient one had tempered and crafted such beauty, and how it came to lie there, all these centuries, covered, uncovered, rehidden, re-exposed, until it came to me, to happen by this place, on this day, made now more perfect. And I would ponder such things as coincidence and circles and synchronicity. And I would pocket this treasure near my heart. And riding on, I would recall having seen such treasure as this elsewhere. But not this one. Not this one. And for one brief moment, I would stiffen with fear at how one quick glance in another direction could have lost this to me forever. And I would touch my shirt over my heart just to make sure. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working Cowboy West and beyond. My guest today is Joel Nelson. If you haven't already listened to it, I would recommend going back to the last episode and listening to the first part of my interview with Joel. Betty Ramsey, the wife of the late Buck Ramsey, said this about Joel. Nowadays, I believe if one were to ask almost any working cowboy about Joel Nelson, they'd likely respond saying, he'd do to ride the river with. In cowboy lingo, that means he's the best of the best, and you could trust him with your life. On this second part of my interview with Joel, I asked him to talk about his first exposure to poetry. Here's Joel Nelson. My mother would read poetry to me when I was small. My mother was a very intelligent lady. Uh, She was a reader and she bought me a lot of books when I was small. There was this series of books called Little Golden Books because they had a little gold binding on the edge of them. Books like Chippy Chipmunk and The Little Red Hen. and So that was my first exposure to literature, but from the time I was probably five or six years old and able to comprehend a little bit more, she began reading poetry to me and it was children's poems like winking blinking and nod and and uh, you know simple poems but the sound of the the meter and the rhyme 
which she delivered very well, kind of caused me to develop a, a liking for those sounds. And I remember when I was about 12, I think probably 12, 11, 10, I don't know, she read a Eugene Field poem to me titled Little Boy Blue. And it's a poem about the death of an infant or a small boy, uh, an unexpected death, and how that affected the little toy animals and the little toy soldiers that he had. It's as if the poem gave them a personality and a life, even though they were toys, stuffed animals, and how he would kiss them and put them to bed, and and how when he was taken away by the angels, that they stood there collecting dust, waiting for him to come back and pick them up and kiss them and put them to bed. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a sad poem. And uh, it was not like anything my mother had ever read to me. But then she took me out to the, to the cemetery at the edge of town, took me out to the, the little graveside where my parents had buried what would have been my older sister. She had passed, she, she had been stillborn. And uh, then that kind of uh, explained why she had read that piece to me. So what had always been kind of uh, entertaining poetry to me became my inclination to look at meaning in poetry. And I don't think I ever lost that. I had, to, had some incredible literature teachers in high school. And I never lost my enthusiasm for the sound of words and the way words were put together. And what they might mean beyond what the actual line said. I, I, I learned to read between the lines and dig deeper. So that was my, I think my initiation into what would have become a lifelong love for poetry. I had, a, you probably heard me tell this story before, I had a a literature teacher when I was a freshman in high school, Miss Anita Welch. She had a twin sister teaching at Seymour High School called Miss Juanita Welch. They were both hometown girls. They were 22 years old. They had just gotten out of college, just finished their student teaching, and they were both beautiful. And Every kid in high school, every every young man in high school had a crush on both of them because they were so darn pretty. And just like at any high school at that day in time, we had to memorize a certain, lines of po a certain number of lines of poetry each year and recite them in front of the class. And I think it was 20 lines maybe at that time. We were expected to recite. I wanted so badly to impress Miss Anita that I memorized The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. By that time in my life, I had started reading a little poetry. Edgar Allan Poe was, was one of my favorites. And uh, the ability that he had to wordsmith 
was just amazing to me. Meticulous rhyme, internal rhyming within the lines, precise rhyming, and he never had to struggle, it seemed, to make two words rhyme. He never had to sacrifice any of the meaning just for the sake of getting two words to rhyme. It was always, it seemed, the best possible word in the English language to portray what he wanted it to say. And it still rhymed. I couldn't get over that. Wow. But anyway, I told Miss Anita, because I wanted to impress her, I want to do The Raven. And it was like she couldn't believe I'd memorized The Raven. She says, well, okay, if that's what you want to do, I'll let you do half of it one day and the other half of it the next day because we can't take that much time for just you and that one poem today, you know. Well, a uh, couple years later, I had another literature teacher, Miss Annalena Kessler, and she was not young and not at all pretty. And she wore lace-up, comfortable, clunky high heel shoes and a flower print dress nearly every day. And when she'd come into class, well, thing, I, I describe her as things shook like two bear cubs scuffling under a wagon sheet. But she had such a passion for poetry and uh, she came into cra class crying one morning and uh, just kind of puddle up and, and cry a little bit during class for two or three days. She finally explained it. Our, our Carl Sandburg had passed away, who she just loved and admired. And, and I thought, wow, uh, poetry must really mean a lot to her. And so that was just another stamp of emphasis on my poetry certificate, I guess. When I got in college, especially when I was here at Sol Ross, I got acquainted with Carlos Ashley, his poetry. Later on, I got to get acquainted with him personally at Elko and here, but uh, I got a, I got a reintroduction to Edgar Allan Poe and Robert W. Service on my own, not because it was any, anything from classes, but I had a roommate here, and uh, we were off campus, and we had a book of Robert W. Service poetry, and we turned all the lights on, off, and light a kerosene lamp and sit it in the middle of the table, and we'd read Robert W. Service poems to one another. So that's something that just kind of carried through my college years. When I went to Vietnam, there was a young lady who wrote me. We never had a romance, never even met one another. But she was a, a pen pal, possibly slightly more than a pen pal, but. I remember Valentine's Day, 1979. I was getting ready to write her a letter, and because it was Valentine's, everywhere we, everywhere we walked that day, I had my eyes open. I was hunting a leaf shaped like a heart. And I finally found one, and I, I put that leaf in the letter for her valentine and wrote a poem to send to her for that occasion. As far as I know, it's the first poem I ever wrote, Vietnam, 1970. Then I would read and hear bits and pieces by Kiss Gadden, Omar Barker, 
principally those two and then there was an advertisement in the Western Horseman magazine I suppose late in 1984 while I was on the Willow Spring camp and uh, it was advertising the first cowboy poetry gathering at Elko and I didn't go to that I went to the second one but I started hearing a little bit of poetry from that first gathering and I thought I can do better than that and that's when I started writing poetry in 1985 seriously there was a guy or two on the crew Cotton Elliott I don't know if you know Cotton Elliott he's a, uh, one of his sisters was married to Tom Morehouse before she, before she passed away Becky uh, his dad Manfred Elliott was the, the brand inspector there at Seymour where I grew up and uh at that time, I was hiring the crews on the 06 Ranch, and, and I'd hired Cotton Elliott to be on a, a fall roundup crew, and he was there that fall of 1984. And he was doing some uh, Curly Fletcher and Bruce Kiscadden stuff, maybe a little old more Barker around the fire in the evening. So rather than just reading poetry. I started getting serious about writing poetry in 1985. In an interview with Josephine Reed for the National Endowment for the Arts, Joel Nelson said this about cowboy poetry. I think a lot of people when they hear the term cowboy poetry, automatically think they're going to hear something funny or entertaining. It can be very deep and very introverted also. My own, I think, is fairly introverted and fairly serious. I very seldom do humorous pieces. I have a few that I do, but I tend to want people to listen rather than to laugh. I do it to inform or maybe get people to think rather than to laugh. I'm not particularly fond of the term cowboy poetry. I suppose it's almost a necessary term because it lends a little bit of interest maybe to people who think, hmm, never heard that term before uh, maybe I want to check that out at the same time I think that that term would probably turn some people off to it who think well <laughs> no way uh, those terms don't even fit together can't be much to it and I, I'm supposing that those would be people with somewhat of an elitist attitude or maybe an academic uh, mindset, background. But I've, I've always just thought that it might detract a little bit from the uh, accountability, not accountability, I don't know the word I'm looking for really, uh, integrity maybe of the poetry to put it in a slot like that that might tend to turn some people away from it. I, I don't like to over categorize things I guess you might say. It's been a useful term. It's probably done a lot to get our work in front of the American public so I can't be too critical of it. When people meet me and, and then maybe recognize 
having heard of me, they might say, oh yeah, you're the, the cowboy poet. Well, I, I'd much rather hear them say, oh, you write poetry. So that's, that's kind of my explanation of maybe that uh, little uh, problem I have with the term. I, I think, and I've always thought, good poetry is good poetry. And it doesn't matter what genre you place it under. Poet Dylan Thomas once said this about poetry. Poetry to a poet is the most rewarding work in the world. A good poem is a contribution to reality. The world is never the same once a good poem has been added to it. A good poem helps to change the shape and significance of the universe, helps to extend everyone's knowledge of himself and the world around him. I think there have been poems written that are so important and that have such a voice and such a story to tell that I don't want to exclude them just in order to do something I've written. You know, I've written poems that I'm proud of. I've written poems that I think have credibility. But I haven't written anything that could compare to Anthem. I haven't written anything that compares to the Ballad of William Sycamore. And sometimes it depends on the audience, or sometimes it depends on the poet or the musician that I'm following who might trigger some kind of uh, an inclination in me to do something other than my own. Randy and I talk about getting on stage and throwing our set list away because of what someone before us has done and just changed the whole flow of the program. And uh, I don't want to stifle that just in order to do my own work. I, I, I have at various times been in a session that allowed me to do just mine. Every now and then I'll, I'll get in a session or maybe once or twice I have that love poems, in which case I'll do my own. Uh, if I'm in a session that's uh, poems inspired by war experience, then I'm probably going to do my own. But, man, there's so much good stuff out there. I, sometimes I just can't resist doing. Uh, Stanley Kunitz, Leonard Cohen, Rudyard Kipling, or Robert W. Service. Badger Clark. I just uh, I do what I do what I think the situation calls for. Back around 1980. Uh, if I put a little more thought to it, I could probably nail down the date a little better. Sometime between 1985 and 90, the National Park Service 
came up with this idea to do a feasibility study with thought in mind of creating another national park in the Davis Mountains. The, the study area encircled a tremendous amount of country out here, outside the mountains, but probably their primary focus would have been that country around Mount Livermore, uh, McDonald Observatory, that Epinauer country, the, the really uh, part of the old X Ranch, Sawtooth Mountain, probably the most scenic of the areas out here. The people in this area were just up in arms about that. And there was a huge outcry made and the National Park Service finally decided to hold a, I guess you would call it a town hall meeting in Fort Davis. And the turnout was tremendous, I was there. And there was so much protest against it that the National Park representatives decided, okay, we're going to, we're going to scrap this idea we're going to turn the funds over that were set aside for this feasibility study back into the general fund and forget about this idea of creating another national park. And it would have all been, of course, private, private land. Anyway, I was so... Uh, upset about the idea of that country becoming a national park that I wrote a piece that I titled Awakening and it was it was kind of about my pilgrimage here we cannot say what drew us here what piper's flute what siren's song in younger days, another year, when sun was low and shadows long, her great high deserts drew us here. We were but boys when we rode in to live the life and chase the dawn, till evening sun shone down on men. Nature was our friend and foe. She dealt us pain. She brought us bliss. Our Mother Earth, we came to know, was nurturer and nemesis. Our cattle graze her hills and draws. Her august grain has ripened now for horseback men with horseback laws, may she be saved from park and plow. We've seen her change since we rode in, have read her pages as they've turned, and worn our stirrup leathers thin. We fear the lessons we have learned. What hands would tear this land apart? We are not all what we appear. We can't afford the careless heart that beat within the pioneer. And red man's wisdom has been cast aside as savage. Yet we see the noble savage doubtless pass much closer to his earth than we. Are we her stewards, foes? Our friend, and who could better serve this earth? We throw these questions to the wind and ride toward answers, timely birth. Mm -hmm.
right, folks, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Joel Nelson for taking the time to visit with me. You can find out more about Joel at cowboypoetry.com slash joelnelson.htm. You can find out more about me and this show at andyhedges.com. If you're enjoying this show and would like to help me keep it going, you can make a donation on my website, or you could write me a review and leave a five-star rating on the iTunes store. Or you could take the time to tell a friend to listen to the show. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads.